My name is Abby. I'm deeply passionate about all things wild and have made it my mission to document many of the world's most stunning trails, be that through day hikes or multi-day long distance walking. Each route is totally unique. Some traverse exposed moorlands and rugged mountain tops, others pass through bustling market towns and historical cities. They follow world-renowned archaeological discoveries and travel through some of the most tranquil valleys and mystical forests accessible on foot. It's not surprising then that they attract walkers from all over the world, many seeking a challenge, others looking to break free from the monotony of everyday life and be inspired by nature. My reason for hiking though is one of discovery and awareness. Getting outside is now more important than ever before, with obesity rates maintaining record highs and mental health issues affecting over one in four individuals. There are incredible landscapes all around us, but so few of us dare to venture into such seemingly inhospitable lands for fear of failure or becoming lost. Well, I'm here to show you otherwise and inspire you to don your walking boots and spend more time in the wild for the benefit of mental and physical health. I've realised that sometimes you don't have to do something crazy or radical to change how you feel about your life, you just have to walk. I face my own trials with mental ill health, as no doubt you'll see throughout my travels, but alongside building a strong support network, getting outside and taking the time to reconnect with nature has helped me move further along the road of personal discovery. So, here's me inviting you to join me on my adventures as I explore this beautiful planet. There will be challenges along the way, and we're not guaranteed to succeed, but it takes a brave heart and a courageous soul to commit to the unknown. Now all you have to do is decide that you want it more than you are afraid of it. Are you ready? Let's go. Oh boy, here we are folks, the official start of the Gritstone Trail. Once again, we are here. Five months ago, I stood in this exact spot, 10th of January, just outside Disley Station. And I believe there's a train just about to arrive. Um, little did I know as I headed off onto my adventure that just 10 miles in, I would be turning around. I've been heading down to Macclesfield to abort my trip and leaving the trail for another day. My mental health was just an unmanageable state. I didn't feel very safe, so I made that decision to step off the trail. Today is that other day. How am I feeling? I'm not sure. A little bit dizzy with the last five months. Just literally every day has been trying to prioritise my mental well-being um, pretty much in exactly the same place as when I headed off ten, five months ago. But there we go, this mental health is, is something that, that comes with me everywhere. Uh, I just do my best every single day until I know better and then I do that. And you know, I'm feeling quite nervous uh, to sort of relive those first 10 miles. Um, but I just need to be as compassionate to myself as I possibly can and give myself a pat on the back for showing up because sometimes that is all we can do is show up. So in the next two days, we have 35 miles to yomp across this wonderful gritstone landscape all the way to Kids Grove. Let's get moving. There's the train. Hello, train. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. All of this amazing wild garlic just carpeting this stretch of wood here. The white flowers bursting through like fireworks. Gotta love it. Even more than these steps. I don't love these steps. <laughs> I literally... It's astonishing how I don't recognise any of this. I was so dissociated last time. I just had no idea where I was, what I was doing. I was trying to get by. It was almost impossible when you're so out of yourself. The trail headed out of Disley following Green Lane Road and offered fantastic views over towards the Cage, an early 18th century hunting lodge sitting within Lyme Park, now owned by the National Trust. And to the west, there were hazy sights over the rolling Cheshire landscape. So if you haven't watched the other video the first time I was on the trail, um, I strongly suggest watching that before this one, because not only will it give you an idea of the contrast in this landscape between the middle of winter and the middle of spring, where we are now, 
but it'll also just help you understand that uh, or what spend more time is about which is getting outside for the benefit of mental and physical health we're building a community of individuals who seek to find their brave push themselves and chase those dreams and you know what sometimes they don't work out and that is the powerful thing about the last time I was on, tr on the trail it didn't work out and yet I still learned so much because I stayed open with my heart and my mind and I received so much from that experience on the trail about self-acceptance and loving myself through and through and it was just incredible um, I feel quite humbled by that experience but we're here again and I'm just open once again to what the trail can teach me. <laughs> this time I very much intend to stay on the actual route. Uh, I was so out of myself last time. Um, I kept missing major turning off and I couldn't make decisions. So I missed Lime Park, which is one of the major features on the route. <laughs> so we'll head up there in a minute and have a chat about that in a second. Um, but also just to fill you in, I'm doing things a little bit differently today. Um, I'm basically, heading for a set point. Uh, so I have 17 miles on the trail today and then a mile and a half off route is the Wild Boar Inn. So I'm gonna camp there because they take camping. Uh, rather than wild camp and just have it as a sketchy, I'm gonna stop somewhere at some point. Um, that gives me something fixed to work towards and I feel really positive about that, quite empowered by it actually. So that's the plan for today, 17 miles via the alpacas. <laughs> So these are the signs we're following. So it says Gridstone Trail, but if it doesn't say that, it's basically a circle with Gridstone Trail, footprint and a G in it. The trail is pretty well signposted. Uh, I didn't really showcase that very well last time, I haven't gone off the route so many times. So this time, we're going that way. Just got my first views of some of the red deer. So uh, just over 1,300 acres of Lime Park is actually a deer park. There's a whole bunch of red deer that sort of populate the area. Used to be hunted for sport. Cool. They're a bit far away, you can only just see them, but that's a nice little spot. <laughs> just heading past this rickety old bridge that they haven't fixed yet. <laughs> Down even more rickety old wooden planks. <laughs> so lovely. Wow, I can't believe we're here already. That felt like a massive slog before. <laughs> so this is the split. That's where I went last time. Basically through Lime Park is a permissive footpath so they can close it at any point. If that was shut for whatever reason, that's the way you go. I just thought that was the main route. So I went that way across the moors. Uh, interestingly, they put a new sign up. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we're not going that way today, we are going this way and with absolute certainty, I step out. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> and here we are, Lime Park, or the East Log entrance. So that's the alternative route, we went that way, by accident, slash on purpose, slash didn't really know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> now we have all of this rather exciting, brand new territory to explore until we get back to the Bowstones and head off along Spawns Hill that way. So I'm super stoked to check this out. Even happier, there's a toilet, I could use that right now. All right, let's go have a look. <laughs> wow. This is what we missed last time. That is rather impressive. Lime Park was once home to the Lee family and in its heyday was a great sporting estate spanning 1400 acres with a medieval herd of red deer. I spotted some stags hanging out close to the path and found myself totally mesmerized by their majestic antlers and solid builds. Literally those deer are the most magnificent beasts. I could never, ever, ever get tired of looking at them. It's 
seems to be some kind of race up there by the cage. Loads of runners going past in their wonderful multicolored clothing. <laughs> Headed down now towards the manor house itself, which is the largest manor house in Cheshire. Sounds rather grand. Uh, earliest records dating back to the 1400. So let's go see what we can see. Amazingly, the Lee family owned the manor house for almost 600 years and oversaw many modifications by notable architects to construct the building that we see today. The formal gardens were added later, in the 19th and 20th centuries, and all is open to the public to visit and explore. I made my way down to the main car park, stopping just briefly to read some of the billboards explaining the area's history and marvel at the huge trees that dominated the area. Right, so I'm presuming the trail just follows the road. I'm hoping the trail just follows the road. <laughs> so this woodland here is Knight's Low Wood. It seems to be made up mostly of pretty giant beech trees. So I'm just wondering how old this forest is. Anyway, uh, in a minute, We'll pop out from the woods and we'll hit Park Moor and then we'll descend down to the Bowstone. So, making nice steady progress, trying to keep warm, but absolutely loving this. Every step, heart is beating nice and fast, not because I'm tired, but because I'm very, very happy. <laughs> On the other side of the forest, the climb up onto the moors was a good one, with far-reaching views behind over the industrial Stockport and Manchester cities. Here we are. The trail goes off that way, and just as a tiny little detour, here, this time in the sunshine, are the Bowstones. It's believed that the Bowstones date back to the 10th century, and both are decorated with interlaced carvings and letters. Local legend actually states that their name was derived from their use by Robin Hood and his men to restring their bows. So as an accumulative total on this trail, we ascend uh, just around 1800 metres. So in 35 miles, that's not too bad in terms of like ups. But we're actually, believe it or not, very close to the highest point on the trail, which is Spons Hill at 410 metres above sea level. So we'll wave to the true point. I don't think we'll go and give it a hug today. And then we'll press on along the trail, which hopefully we should be able to see just meandering on in front of us from that high point. So we've got this junction here to the right, just up there then, that is the summit. Oh, there you go, there's the true point, you can just make it out. On the horizon, standing proud, we wave and carry on. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that little lamb has just been born. Whoa, two, there's twins. They've just been born. Oh, bless you, little mama sheep. Wow, that is like a real life miracle up on the moors to have just seen two little baby lambs basically be born. <sighs> Taking their first steps and snuggling up with their mum. Oh man, special moment. <laughs> Can you see the emotion right now? Oh, so much love. <laughs> Here we are then, this is Bakestone Road. 
aptly named because essentially it's named after cakes, which is very exciting. Allow me to explain. <laughs> so the grit stone, so this coarse hard stone that's been quarried in the area for hundreds of years, uh, has been used for building roads, buildings, dry stone walls. Um, it's used for making or was used for making millstones to mill the flour and to sharpen blades, but it was also used uh, or the stone which was quarried out was used as a bake stone. So it'd be placed by a fire and they'd put their breads and their cakes on the stone high uh, and then basically it would cook. So in my mind, if I was going to interpret this correctly, uh, this road is essentially rather excitingly named after cakes. So you can't go wrong there really. We're walking on Cake Road. <laughs> the trail didn't follow the road for very long and soon turned off into sheep-filled fields past old machinery left to rust and decay in the weather. Everything about this right now just feels so right. I don't think there's anywhere else I should be today. I don't think there's anything else I should be doing. I trusted the journey and here I am. I can definitely tell it was the right decision to come here, even though yesterday I was really struggling to know what to do as I drove up. I couldn't, I didn't really have much of a choice there. I couldn't drive back because the whole of the motorway heading south was just at a standstill. So I just kept driving and kept driving and landed up here. But uh, I'm just getting this immense sense of peace. And like, it just feels like the trees are welcoming me back. Like they have leaves now and the sound of the wind through those leaves rustling. I just can't stop grinning. Like I understand it. I speak the language of this world, of the outdoors. This really is where I belong. My home is on the trail. The satisfaction that I feel as I pack up my tent and leave nothing behind. And the immense gratitude and overwhelm I feel as I experience these landscapes. It doesn't matter if it's raining or if it's sunny, but if I'm in a sound mind, there is just nowhere else I'd rather be. Just on the trail, every corner, there's a hidden surprise. It's all a big adventure. You never know what you're gonna see. And you've just gotta embrace it every step and just keep showing up. Fear will come too. There's nothing you can do about that. Adventure and fear go hand in hand, but you have to just acknowledge the fear and allow it to, to come in partnership just don't let it take the wheel, don't let it drive. Fear can never be in control. Courage is in control. You can just keep showing up. That's quite high. <laughs> and breathe. <laughs> hey, there she is. That's why Nancy just up there on the top of Carriage Ridge. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> Wow, look at that, she's glistening. Before long, I found myself dropping down past Beristall Hall Farm and some duck ponds, which not only boasted ducks, but also an amazing array of wildflowers. Oh my goodness me. They're cowslips. Whoa, look how many there are. Wow. Next, the path took me over the lovely Harrop Brook via a little pack horse bridge, probably dating back to the 17th and 18th centuries. Is that nice? Yummy grass. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you're missing, human. So once again, I'm gonna bypass the farm made tea room. So I still don't know what they're gonna be like. <laughs> um, I wanna stop at Teg's Nose Country Park. I've heard good things about their tea cakes and I'm a real sucker for tea cakes. So I'm gonna head up to White Nancy, have a sit down there, a bit of a rest, and then press on to Teg's Nose and stop properly there. But I remember this bit. This is beautiful as it was before. It's awkward steps. <laughs> So that up there is White Nancy. We've got a big climb up to the top, but we're nearly there. 
But all along here, this is Carriage Hill. And uh, just on the other side, we should be able to see some quarries, which I believe are still active today. So that'll be interesting to check out. Nice bluebell wood to the right there. <laughs> Lovely. After passing through countless fields, I finally emerged to a beautiful crossing over the bubbling River Dean. It was the most peaceful spot and I savoured the moment. Okay, and so begins the climb up to the top of White Nancy. First up this road and then we pick up a little track to the top. Here we are. Last bit of the ascent just here, right to the top. So I know for sure it's gonna be real windy at the top. So I'll just give you the quick spiel about White Nancy now. So it was built in 1817 by a chap called John Gasket to commemorate the victory at the Battle of Waterloo. And it overlooks Bollington, the town of Bollington just down there, which, uh, played a pretty major role in the cotton spinning industry. Nowadays, not so much, but still it stands. Um, now the real debate about White Nancy is whether it's named after one of John's daughters or after the lead horse that worked to pull this massive rock right to the top of the hill. Anyway, we'll take a closer look in a minute. It was a short, heart-rate raising climb to the top of the hill at 280 metres above sea level, but I enjoyed every step. Whew! Yes! And here she is! Oh, White Nancy! What a place to stand in! Oh, I'm so glad to be here! Wow! You haven't changed one bit, old girl! Not since the 1800s! Actually, that's a lie, she has changed. She used to have an entrance but it's now been blocked up. As you can see. <laughs> oh, wow. And these views. Man, they're vast today. Wow. <laughs> hey, check this out. So these are bilberry bushes. If you've watched any of my videos, you know I love a good bilberry. And you can see they're in flower at the moment, these pinky white flowers. So each of them, hopefully, later in the season, late July, get some nice bilberries to harvest. I'm very aware that at some point I need to drop off to the east. I don't want to go all the way to the high point of Carriage Hill, which is just over 300 meters above sea level. The main trig point, uh, or the route doesn't go past the main trig point. So if I end up there like last time, I've missed the turn off again. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep my eyes open. Uh, although I'm getting very distracted because just to my right, so to my west, is one of the quarries. I've dumped a load of stuff, so you can't see it very clearly, but. All right. So this is obviously where I went wrong. I went up there to the top and it looks like I've just got to drop down there somehow. This way, is it? It's a bit weird. Dropping down off the hill, I found myself plunged into the most beautifully managed woodland, alive with birdsong and home to the remains of an old cotton mill dating back to 1789. The path then joined the B5470 for a short stretch near Tower Hill before continuing south along a marked footpath. Does that mean up here? I think so. There's like a maze of dry stone walls around here all patched together with this grit stone. It's a real art dry stone warning, carried out for hundreds and hundreds of years. As you can see, there's no filling. 
It's just stone strategically placed one upon another upon another to make a solid wall that lasts for years and years. Some of them, they really are hundreds of years old. It's incredible. Okay, so this is it. This is the spot where I left the trail last time, headed down the road to Macclesfield. I struggled for so long to get to this very point that I had to call it a day. It's kind of weird being back here, but I am. And guess what? We're gonna carry on. New territory, folks. Keep showing up, keep going, one step at a time. That's what this is about. Take nothing for granted, just give you all. And that's what I'm gonna do now. Tegs nose, here we come. <laughs> Through the wall, <laughs> literally. Wow. <laughs> it's actually amazing to be treading on this new trail. I've waited months for this, just dreamt of it, trying to help myself heal and grow, and here I am. Life is not ever guaranteed to be easy. We have to persevere, and I feel like that's what I've done. I've given my all at persevering. Every day is a test, it's a trial, but it's also a gift. And to see it as both of those, to recognize it's an opportunity every day to grow stronger, I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, we're very close to Teg's nose. And we've been talking about it for a while, but what is it? Well, nowadays it is a country park, but in the past it's been an area of quarrying. In fact, from the 16th century right up to the mid 1900s, it's been quarried. Um, first of all, by hand, very hard labor, but then they use blasting methods and techniques uh, and nowadays it's just open for the public, come and roam, walk your dog, cycle about, have a bit of fun, eat some tea cakes at the, the visitor centre, hopefully. Um, so yeah, it's just amazing how these places transform through time and they're still so treasured by the local communities. And in fact, uh, there's a Bronze Age further, to, oh, a Bronze Age Barrow, sorry, further to the south, which is evidence, obviously, of occupation and actually significant occupation since the Bronze Age because to put a barrow there means it's a special place to bury someone significant. So to go through all that effort and labor to build a barrow in the first place means this land must have been treasured by those people. But uh, also the, the name uh, Tegs Nose in Old English was Tegs Nays, meaning sheep of the north. So potentially once, you know, we were no longer hunter gathering, but settling down in communities and farming the land, there were sheep here, which is amazing actually, because there's still sheep here today. Probably not the same sheep though, because that would be that would be quite disturbing. <laughs> right, let's find this visitor centre. So you can see how far we've walked, all the way from Disley, all the way along, all the way along, up down, up down, roundabout, doodly doodly. Oh, there's Teg's nose. And then pretty much just gotta go over Crocker Hill. And I think it's about here. We cross the main road and we head down there to the campsite. It was great to see the area busy with walkers and cyclists who had travelled from far and wide to enjoy the country park and tea rooms. Despite the chilly temperatures, I opted to sit outside so I could air my tent and had a great chat with some fellow walkers who were hoping to walk the trail later in the year. Right, leaving the cafe behind. That was indeed a very good tea cake, and the tea wasn't half bad either. So we're gonna work our way up to the highest point on Teg's nose, and then just continue along the trail. Many more ups and downs to come, so it's good to feel fueled. <laughs> it's definitely getting colder, actually. If you can't control your dog, put it on a lead. As the owner of this land, I have a right to shoot dogs chasing and harming my livestock. Hmm. So now that we're actually within Tex Nose Country Park, I thought I'd have a chat about Macclesfield, which is that big urban sprawl down there. That's where I walked down to last time and caught the train back. But this time I don't need to go within the buildings. 
I can just look down and wave. And actually, it looks like it's raining over there, so that's definitely not going that way. <laughs> the country park proved to be an interesting place to walk through, with deep excavations from its history of quarrying clearly visible, and old machinery and billboards left on the side of paths for passers-by to observe and learn from. Whoa, take a look at this. <laughs> Land has been completely scraped away. Hang on a minute. This isn't hail. It's flipping snowing. <laughs> what? <laughs> like these are genuine snowflakes. I so hope the camera's picking this up because I'm not going crazy. <laughs> oh well. Snow or no snow, we've got to keep moving. <laughs> the highest point of the country park sat at 380 metres above sea level, and it was here at the southern edge of the ridge that the path began to descend. There were great views over the Tegsnose and Bottom Reservoirs built in 1850 and 1871 to power the mills of Macclesfield. Huh. This looks interesting. New sign, new wall. Wow, that is very new. <laughs> the reservoirs now supply Macclesfield with drinking water, and although a working environment, clearly proved a haven for wildlife. I watched swifts flying all around catching flies, and coots and geese swimming about on the surface, and even spotted some fish lurking around in the shadows. Pressing on, I followed a quiet lane past a farm and a small stream connecting the reservoirs. It's raining heavy over there. Let's hope it doesn't come this way. <laughs> the trail continued through countless fields, each more beautiful than the other, with banks and boundaries lined with bluebells all dancing in the wind, and huge oak trees standing confidently in the middle, with their leaves whispering to one another. I lost myself in the experience, fully immersed in the joys of spring and the freedom of life on the trail. Striking gorse there lining the path. Wow, and if you could smell it, so coconutty. <laughs> wow. Amazing colour. So that's Macclesfield Forest all the way back there now. Tegs nose, there's the edge of it. The giant scree slump there. Wow. It's amazing to see how far we've come. What is this? Complex of gates. <laughs> Go through one, round, and then into the second. Squeeze. Ooh. Good. <laughs> and then we escape right here. Nice. Just uh, add a little bit of fun to the day. <laughs> what the flip? <laughs> I'm just like muttering to myself certain things. And then look, giant quarry. Well, not that giant, but rather large. Hole in the earth. Hmm. Ah, oh, that cow has a terrible aim. Why, cow? <laughs> Let's steer clear of that part. <laughs> oh, no. Oops. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. <laughs> I was working along Crocker Hill on Sutton Common, and every step took me closer to a 72 metre high BT radio mast. Interestingly, as with many of the masts in the area, for survivability during a nuclear war, is built with reinforced concrete. We made it to the radio tower. Honestly, I've been able to see it all day. It feels quite remarkable to actually be stood underneath it now. <laughs> hey, beauty. Oh, you're so nice and warm. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> so cheese. Don't eat my hand. <laughs> Oh, you are so beautiful. Look at you, your amazing colors. Wow. <laughs> I 
Okie dokie, here we are. The A54. Nearly. Ooh, there we go. Okay, we finally reached it. This is it. Happy days. So, if I'm right with my navigation, then the trail should continue on the right in a few seconds. Let's see if we can find that. Yep, here we are. So, tomorrow, we'll come back up the road and we'll join the trail again here and head off that way, apparently. It's rather exciting. So, we're just going to work down this road to the pub, however long it takes. doesn't really matter. I've just got to get there. As long as it's not busy, then we're fine because there is no footpath. Uh, and then tomorrow, we'll head on for the second half of the trail. This pretty much is as near to halfway as you can get. Ooh, she made me jump. <laughs> um, but... You know, I'm just going to really prioritise this time, to use it for reflection of the day. It's been a good day, there's been so much to see, big things, little things, and I'm feeling really accomplished. It was a straightforward trek to the inn, and thankfully the road wasn't too busy. Inside, I discovered the building to be full of character, with a really friendly atmosphere. I was warmly welcomed and instantly felt at home. Job done. First half of the Gritstone Trail in the bag. All the boots. Under the boots. Traversed, trekked, ticked off. Happy days. <laughs> Heading round the back of the inn, I found a quiet corner and set up camp before settling down for a solid night's sleep. Morning guys. <laughs> Good morning. Wow. It feels nice to be awake and alive today. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this blue sky is domineering the day or if the clouds over there are going to dominate the day. But either way, we have a mammoth day ahead of us. Basically, the plan for today, if I was going to break this down, is essentially walk this 18 miles plus whatever this is back to the trail to Kids Grove. Then I have to catch a train with two changes back to Disley. Then I have to find my car and then I have to drive back down to Somerset. So long day. <laughs> There's not so much to sort of split the day. Um, compared to yesterday, so obviously yesterday we had, you know, like white Nancy takes nose and all that, but not so much today until we get uh, much closer to Kids Grow. Just nice steady walking, lots of hills, lots of views hopefully, and with any luck and grace and goodness, we'll make it down to Kids Grow to the end of the Gritstone Trail. Wow, <laughs> five months later, but. Let's not set my mind there. Let's just take in each step and be grateful for every moment that we've got. So that's the plan today. Second half of the Gritstone. Let's do this. <laughs> Good morning to you, Mr. Blackbird. Lovely song. <laughs> Okie dokie, here we are then. Back on the trail, striding out into new lands. First up, across the cattle grid. <laughs> Looks a bit gnarly. Doo -doo -doo. Hang on, center of gravity. Come on, wake up, Harvey. Oh. Okay, challenge one. <laughs> oh, good morning, sheep. Lovely day. The route followed Min End Lane up to the top of Golden Hill, and the climb really did feel golden. It was the most glorious morning to be out on the trail. We got shades on people, feeling good about life. <laughs> uh, actually, I was just thinking about how, how significant and important mornings are for me. So even when I'm on home turf, and I'm just, I don't know, working all day or whatever, um, I make a point, I'm an early riser anyway, but I always, always, always am out walking by seven. Um, this time of morning is so special to me. It's like a commune with the earth time. It's like a, wake up and find your meaning sort of time and I'm just so inspired by the light and the song and you know even if it's raining just 
just by the melodies that the earth sings in the morning, it just really brings my soul to life, regardless of how good or bad the night's been or how good or bad I'm feeling about the day ahead. So it's really so important for me to, to just access the light. And actually, you know, on a scientific level, getting sunlight on your skin helps with the, the production of vitamin D, that hormone. Um, but also getting light first thing in the morning can just help with our quality of sleep the evening to come. So loads of positives about getting out and about in the morning. And of course the bird song for me as well. Um, I made a video in my monthly mindfulness series talking about the dawn chorus and how Taking the time to get up and listen to that can be such an inspiring and empowering thing. Hearing the joy in the birds' songs, you know, nothing for them is guaranteed about the day ahead, and yet still they sing. And every day I strive to emulate that with my words and my actions. I allow my heart to sing and just keep showing up and stepping out. <laughs> oh, whoa! That's far away, but there's like a viaduct thing over there. Viaduct, aqueduct, not sure which. Probably a viaduct. Hmm, I wonder where that is. We're just drawing parallel with that body of water, which is Bosley Reservoir. And I believe when we drop down, we're gonna meander along a little brook and then work our way up there. And that, that is the cloud. So we're going to head up there and hopefully once we get to the top of there, we'll have views down towards Kids Grove because that is a significant outcrop. Oh, deer. Deer just down there. Oh, look at them. There's four. <laughs> the fields went on for a bit, but eventually I dropped down into the most heavenly woodland again with its floor carpeted in the striking purples of bluebells and whites of stitchwort flowers. My map showed the trail leaving the woodland behind, but things on the ground proved to be a little bit different, as the trail was now lined with new trees that had been planted so that in a few years the area would be even more wooded. Sorry, Mr. Pheasant. <laughs> oh, nice. So here's the River Dane, and we actually join the Dane Valley Way for a little bit as well. Very exciting. Wow. I had researched ahead of time that the next stretch following a conduit was often overgrown with nettles and brambles. Thankfully though, those expectations never manifested and instead the path was clear and easy to follow. I'm getting the most bizarre vibes from this stretch of trail. It's lovely and I'm just really enjoying the reflections of the fallen branches and the bluebells and the trees in the water. But at the same time, I don't dare look too close because there's like a grave of just dead life underneath the surface in the murky gloom. And uh, it's kind of sending shivers up my spine. So I'm, I feel kind of like afraid to stop. And yet at the same time, I'm pulled in by the beauty reflected on the surface. Maybe it's a trap, who knows? <laughs> Some kind of pack horse bridge. <laughs> I like that one. Much to my relief, the trail eventually left the conduit behind and crossed over the A523, then continued west underneath a disused railway, on through more fields, before joining Ravenscloud Brook. I'm completely in awe of the beauty in this stretch of woodland. What an amazing time of year to be here. Just this sea of bluebells and the little uh, brook there, just down at the bottom, bubbling away happily, merrily, <laughs> as the trail winds gently upwards. This is a very good life moment. <laughs> I'm gonna store this in my memory for a long time. <laughs> Ooh, 
really enjoying this steady ascent up towards the summit of the cloud. Uh, I've been looking forward to being on this stretch for three reasons. One is a great marker of progress. It feels like just to be able to see that on the map and look at how far we traveled, it's really rewarding. Uh, two, we've just joined up with the Staffordshire Way, so another long distance trail, and that is also very exciting. Uh, but the third reason is because I have an opportunity to talk about geology. Uh, so basically, the rocks underneath our feet really can and do impact the flora that we see around us, so the plants above the surface. And basically, these lower slopes of the cloud, uh, these are all made up of a type of mudstone. It's very rich in nutrients. All of these plants, the flowers, the trees, the bushes, the grasses, their roots can take hold and they can flourish here. However, as we get higher up onto the cloud, you'll see the landscape start to change. Uh, we'll get more sort of heathland plants because the geology, so the stone, becomes a Chatsworth grit. So it's a type of sandstone from around sort of three, 360 million years ago. So it's pretty old. Um, and basically it's much harder for plants to sort of take root there. Obviously it's more exposed as well, but um, what we'll see is just different plants. So we'll start to see our heathers and our tormentils. And if there's any moisture up there, we might see some cotton grass and all of the kinds of plants that flourish in that area. So just take note as, as we keep walking of the, the changing landscapes that we see, uh, because it's just incredible how the rocks underneath our feet really do affect what we can walk through. And even more incredible is this whole, the cloud and the sort of valley around us has been shaped over all of the ice ages that have been through this area. So the glaciers have been slowly moving through. Obviously they're gone now, so they were slowly moving through and grinding away the mudstone. So, you know, whilst this area is very much managed by mankind now, nature has always had the upper hand and really always will be in control. Wow, that is a lot of steps. <laughs> Um, okay, one step at a time, two, three, four, 65, 66, 67, 68. We'll see if any more turn up. Whew, it's good stuff. It didn't take long for the trees to thin out and I soon found myself walking up the exposed upper flanks of Cloud Hill with the path lined with bilberry and heather bushes. It was a truly delightful stretch of walking. Oh my goodness, here we are then, the top of the cloud. Wow. And amazingly, we can look right across the landscape we traveled through the last couple of days. The radio mast where we started today and beyond. 360 panorama. No words, folks. That's insane. And after all these months of dreaming of being here, Heart is just in my mouth. Wow. Okay, let's get to Timbersbrook and then we'll keep pressing on uh, down to Kids Grove. So we've probably got just over 10 miles left now, which is utterly astonishing. Uh, it's just moving by really, really quickly. Time is flying, but I'm loving the energy that's pulsing through my body as I walk through this incredible landscape. Whilst I stood there up on the top, I was just thinking about what a magnificent vantage point this is and how I'd be surprised if there was no evidence of occupation from prehistory, you know, maybe an Iron Age hill fort or something. But then again, in my head, I was like, well, how would people survive up here? Because yes, you have a 360 view all around and you can keep an eye out for enemies and any attackers, but you have no water, there's no water up here. And that's what we'll see as we drop down into the valleys is there'll be a lot more water, it'll become much more abundant. And that's where all the towns and the villages and the cities are. They're all around the water, the giver, the sustainer, the provider of life. Let's go see if we can find some. Silver birch trees and bilberry bushes. This stretch of trail is a dream. My favorite tree and one of my favorite shrubs obviously they've still got their flowers on like we talked about earlier or yesterday but later in the season they'll be boasting blue orbs of glorious vitamin c and deliciousness
Hey, look, these are usually a sign of wet ground, but check these giant flowers out. So these are king cups and they are just the most vibrant yellow. <laughs> it's really nice spotting them and they always remind me of Dartmoor because that's where I first learned to ID them. So we have here some images of the mills and how the area was worked. Look at these chimneys, huge reaching up into the sky here as well. Wow. Times past, never forgotten though. Leaving Timbersbrook behind, the trail crossed through a number of fields filled with dandelions and other wildflowers before joining the Bidolf Valley Railway. Now the track itself was used sort of during the 17th right up through to the 19th century to carry coal down into Congleton and sand out to the potteries and beyond. Um, nowadays obviously, as is the case with many railways, it's been replaced by pedal power so we can walk and cycle along it, although I won't be doing any cycling today. Okay. Hey, we have a good billboard. Bit off Valley Way. So that's another long distance footpath. Just showing some of the beautiful flowers and wildlife you can expect to see here. Many of which we've seen, so tick, 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 maybe. Haven't seen any, you've definitely heard some. Heard nut hatches as well. Haven't really been paying attention to butterflies to be honest. Maybe. Tick, tick. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> It was lovely to see the trail being used by walkers, cyclists and runners alike, and I enjoyed spotting the remains of the railway, such as bridges and old signal posts. The path soon entered the Whitemore Local Nature Reserve, and although only one kilometre long, a billboard informed me that it stands as an important refuge for wildlife. Not the happiest human on the planet. Uh, I just felt like I was going on for too long, and I just checked the... Uh, GPS on view ranger and I have a missed the turning um, Just I didn't see it man. I was looking really hard for signs, so I'm quite surprised by that Let's go down here and see what we can do Oh look, there's a sign that would have been helpful up there mate oh, Flip these are some serious stairs Wow, look at this tunnel <laughs> See all the trees here, how gnarly they are. It's an indicator this is Cecil Woodland, especially with the bilberries as well. Ancient kind of woodland, very special. Oh, why people? Why just leave that there? Where is it gonna go in this natural place? Oh. Right, let's get some space in my pack then. It actually really distresses me if I find litter in a natural environment like this because, you know, this is not an easily accessible place. There is a road, but I don't think you can park on it. So you'd have to like pedal or walk quite far to get here. And you come out to do something in nature. Why would you leave stuff behind that can potentially destroy it and degrade it and ruin the enjoyment of it for other people wanting to do the same thing? It just does not add up. So I kind of think if you can't respect nature, you shouldn't be allowed in it because this is our home. This is all we've got really. And if we ever lose sight of the fact that we are part of it, I just think it's really damaging, not only to our mental and physical health, but I think to our spiritual health and so much more. That's how we end up with things like global climate change and the uh, you know, marine debris and destruction of the rainforests and so on. Those are big things, but the little things matter too. So take your litter home, people. Follow the countryside code. <laughs> okay, ran over. Where are we? Looks like we just follow this road now. That's what I reckon anyway. So just arrived here, this is Cheshire's Close, the viewpoint right over 
the Cheshire Plain there. It's pretty awesome. It's definitely hazier than yesterday, but there's all this like sort of memorial stuff here. Loads of graves, um, like memory stones. And then talking to litter, look at that, so much. I don't think it's the best place to be remembered if you're just in a landfill site. It's just such a shame. FYI, there is actually a bin here. <laughs> the road wasn't very busy, but the cars passing were traveling really fast. So I was glad to find a trail that followed parallel to the road that felt much safer to walk along and certainly more enjoyable too. As you saw from the sign there, we're pretty much at the old man and Mo, which is this epically huge outcrop of grit stone. Uh, basically also this whole area has been quarried since the Iron Age right up until the Victorian period for quern stones which are used for milling corn and things. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but I was not expecting that. <laughs> Look. <laughs> there are a number of theories as to why such a large rock was left behind by the quarrying. Some say that it was used to aid lifting of large gritstone slabs. It's more likely, however, that it was left out of respect, as it's situated on the site of an ancient cairn and burial mound. It's a real hodgepodge of paths around here struggling to know which to follow. Um, it's kind of a free-for-all. This one looks quite substantial. Ah, there it is. There's Malcorp Castle. Wow. As I say, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was not expecting this of Malcorp, of the old man of man of Malcorp Castle. So Malcorp Castle uh, is, is a folly castle. It was built in 1754, but given over to the National Trust in sort of the mid 1900s. And I'm hoping we can go have a quick snoop around there, but I'm slowly running out of time. I'm just watching it tick away like, mm. um, nice viewpoint from here though. Here we go, Malcorp. Let's go check it out. This feels so bizarre. It's like something out of Lord of the Rings and yet it's not even that historical. <laughs> the ridge upon which the castle sits forms the boundary between the counties of Cheshire and Staffordshire. Visitors were once allowed to explore the inside of the folly, but it's now been fenced off. On the turn of the millennium in the year 2000 though, a large fire was built inside of the folly as part of a network of communicating beacons around the country. Right, well that was Mao or Mo or however you say it. Quite an impressive place, but uh, it's just starting to rain. I thought it was getting cold and the air quite damp, uh, but I just need to sort of try and find the path again because just like earlier, there's loads of paths here. Um, I don't think it's far away at all. And then I will probably layer up and we'll press on for the last few miles on towards the Macclesfield Canal and Kids Grove. Can't quite believe it really. I dropped down through Mocop Village, which is often referred to as the home of primitive Methodism. The Memorial Church was built in 1862 on the site of the first open air meeting, which took place in 1807, attracting over 2000 people. So as we head down from Malcop Castle then, we're pretty much leaving most of the climbing behind us. Uh, we're headed out into the plains. It's reasonably flat, hence the canal. So um, that should make for some speedy walking actually. My legs are feeling good now. Um, I was definitely feeling tired earlier, but they sort of loosened up and freshened out. So feeling good. And here it is, Macclesfield Canal, built in 1831 by my old friend Thomas Telford. I say old friend because I followed a lot of his engineering projects in Scotland and they're all pretty mind-blowing to be honest, way ahead of his time. But the canal is one of them. This whole area is a designated conservation area as well, uh, designated in sort of the mid 1900s. And it is this very canal that will take us right to the end of the trail at Kidsgrove Station. Absolutely stoked. 
and really can't quite believe that we are here. Walking along the canal was lovely and I stopped to chat to the fishermen, all sat in a row along the edge of the water, staring at the ends of their rods, okay. waiting for signs of movement. What sort of thing can you catch here? Um, mainly roach and bream. Nice. Yeah. Wow, those maggots look really appealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> happy fishing. Life along the canal seemed to be pretty chilled out. There were ducks swimming along the surface, and boats moored up awaiting their next adventure. It was great fun ducking underneath old bridges and watching as locks filled up with water as they raised or lowered the boats. It was a long walk, but I really enjoyed it. Oh, this is where we leave the canal, is it? Oh wow, river. Wasn't, wasn't expecting that. Gosh, look at the contrast in colour between that muddy brown and that a bit less muddy brown. Actually, it's not that big a contrast as I thought. <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. This is all part of the canal as well. Oh, Flip is big. Whoa. Check this out. This stretch of waterway was actually the Trent and Mersey Canal. Running for 93 and a half miles, it was built in 1966 to create an inland route between the major ports of Hull and Liverpool. It has more than 70 locks and five tunnels along its length. I followed the canal feeling blissfully calm, knowing that every step would bring me closer to Kidsgrove Station and the end of the trail. I wasn't ready for it to end, but I couldn't wait to find myself living out the moment I've been dreaming of for so long. Is this us? This looks like us. Okay, wave goodbye to the canal. It has been wonderful and I'll see you again sometime to the station. Oh, this is it. Wow, just here. Almost walked past it. Oh, we've done it. This is the end of the Gritstone Trail. 35 miles we've walked. Yesterday we headed out from Disney. We traveled through some utterly spectacular, mind-blowing landscapes. The views blew away any expectations I could have had. You know, I am so glad things didn't work out in January because I might not have come back and look at what I would have missed. And in fact, the journey, the lesson that I've learned from this trail, having approached it twice, accumulatively, they've just reinforced the importance for me in this world of mental health where we all are so fragile and yet we try to be so tough. We have to take care of ourselves and showing up that courage, the courage it takes to showing up, the bravery it takes is in that, whether we succeed or not, that we grow and we heal. And I've done everything I can on this trail. Both times I gave everything I had. It just happens that this time we made it and I've loved it. I've loved every step. I haven't stopped smiling for crying out loud. Like my legs got a bit tired, but the landscape has just spurred me on every step. It's sung to me and has lured me on. And here we are, the end of the trail, the end of the Gritstone Trail. So I just hope guys in some way you've been inspired to head out on an adventure that perhaps you've been putting off. Find that courage, show up, give it your all. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. The beauty of these trails is they're not going anywhere. We can always come back and try again. Thank you for following my journey, folks. It has been an absolute pleasure to share it with you. I'm gonna try and figure out what to do about trains. That place looks pretty shut down. It is a Sunday, but hopefully there'll be something that can take me home. That's up to me. I'm just gonna stand here for a bit and breathe because I just need to absorb this moment and congratulate myself. Whew, job done. Enjoy your adventures, guys, and stay wild. <laughs> I headed to the station and readied myself for the long trip home. I felt deeply humbled by my time on the trail and knew that the experience would shape me for years to come. I had turned past failures and regrets into stepping stones that carried me forwards towards an end goal. But I realised it wasn't the end goal that mattered, but the journey and everything I'd learned along the way. I knew that I'd face difficulties with my mental health again on the trail in the future, but now I had a new belief in myself, knowing that there was something deep inside of me greater than any obstacle. And that something lives in you too. This is our life, our journey, our adventure. And all it's asking us to do is to show up.
just as we are, and to trust the unfolding that will follow.